All right, all right. It's about that time. Good evening, good evening. Hope everybody's doing well. We'll get started here in just a minute or two. Gonna get started in just a minute. Hope everybody's doing well tonight. Well, I know we'll probably have a few more folks jumping on with us here uh, in the next couple of minutes, and that's fine. I just wanted to we'll go ahead and get started here. Let me say, first of all, if you're jumping on with us and today was your first day of school, I hope you had a great first day. Uh, you were prayed for uh, by me and I know by others. We took some time this morning on Facebook at 10 o'clock to... To kick off our 40 days of prayer, I hope that you're planning on doing that with us. Uh, you can find that prayer calendar right here on our Facebook page, or if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, just go to the Gilmer Church Facebook page, facebook.com slash gilmercofctx. You can download that there, so you can have that prayer calendar, and uh, we can be prayerful each day together. That's an important thing for us to do as we start this school year together. I hope you had a great first day. Uh, let, me, let me start by way of an announcement. Um, you will be getting a call from a shepherd 
Uh, if you haven't already gotten that call, you'll get it at some point, uh, maybe tonight or tomorrow. But I'm excited to say that we're going to start back in person worshiping on Sunday. We will gather here uh, at 10 o'clock here on Buffalo Street. We will continue to live stream. And uh, I hope that you will plan to be with us um, in person as we kick off that again this week. Just, this is just me personally reflecting with those of you who are, who are on board with us. It's hard preaching to an empty room. And uh, it's draining. Uh, and it, it's not like we're sitting up here uh, twiddling our thumbs. We're up here uh, working hard and, and missing you when we're not together. I can promise you that. Uh, I want to thank Jeff Clemens and Ross Wise and Bill Hickman for all of uh, of their help in helping us live stream. And uh, but even with that, we're going to be doing the same thing with folks in person. So it'll be great to see your faces in the pews, uh, socially distanced and masked, though they may be. But we'll look forward to being back together this Sunday. Uh, tell your friends and plan to be with us. Well, tonight we are continuing into the 1960s, our second week looking at that. And tonight we get into the subject of racism and social justice. Uh, from time to time, I like to recommend resources to you. Uh, and I want to recommend two books to you tonight if you're interested. The first of these uh, is a book by Robert Hooper. It's called A Distinct People, uh, Churches of Christ in the 20th Century. And obviously this book needs to be updated because we're no longer in the 20th century. Uh, but it's a good book nonetheless. Hooper taught church history at Lipscomb for a long, long time. Respected theologian and churchman. Encourage you to look at that book. Uh, and the other is a little more uh, relevant to our conversation tonight. And it's by a friend who lives down in Tyler and preaches for the Tenaha Church. The Fight is On in Texas. A History of African American Churches of Christ in the Lone Star State by Ed Robinson. Edward Robinson. You can find this and several other books uh, by him on Amazon. This is a great book. It's been a, a great resource for me. I encourage you to look up both of these books, A Distinct People and The Fight is On in Texas. That one by Edward J. Robinson. Well, we are continuing into the 60s. And last week we talked about uh, sort of the prevailing culture the environment in which churches of Christ are growing in the 1960s. One that is uh, focused intently on anti-communism, anti-Catholicism, and a strong pro-Vietnam sentiment, all within um, the picture of churches of Christ predominantly in the South, absorbing the conservative white Southern value uh, or values or ethic um, that is dominating the scene in churches of Christ. And while uh, message subjects and delivery are beginning to change and technology and media uh, is growing, there are some other things that are happening, and I'm just going to talk about these because we're going to focus on the last one. We've seen uh, churches of Christ grow as it moves from a rural and agrarian group to a middle class group, as it moves from a back burner group to a, a, a place of national prominence. Locally, it moves from a local unknown to a place of civic leadership and civic prominence with uh, its members moving from uneducated to becoming very educated. And the last one, which is where we're going to really camp tonight and probably next week, the transformation of a group from a sect to a denomination. Now, like I said last week, whether you view this however you view this or not, when we think about historical perspective, this is the way everybody sees us. And reality is our friend, so it's helpful to understand the lenses through which other people are seeing churches of Christ. And really, churches of Christ don't have any kind of play on the national scene or even on the big local scene if this is not true. Uh, now, we're, we're not talking about this uh, in the sense of uh, of biblical theology it's more along a sociological line but it's important because this is the the stage for which churches of Christ are going to embrace the struggle for social justice in the 1960s and, and, and in many ways this is a book that's still being written uh, it's still being told because it's not 
it's not a story that's been fixed yet. And we have much work, to, much work to do in helping to solve the problems of racial and social justice. Um, but as churches of Christ have moved from a sect to a denomination, we begin to look at the dominant response of predominantly white members in churches of Christ to issues of social justice and racial equality that dominated the 1960s. Uh, these changes that are taking place uh, in churches of Christ uh, over the course of this transformation right here uh, have to do with the move from uh, what we have from time to time talked about an apocalyptic worldview with an emphasis more on the kingdom of God and counterculture toward just embracing the dominant accepted southern values, okay? I want us to walk through uh, some theological things to help us understand uh, where our understandings and our, our, our theology uh, has informed our beliefs with regard to racism and social justice back in the movement's beginning, okay? Uh, a very early and telling clue about how Churches of Christ uh, and, and the attitude toward slavery that was prevalent early on um, comes to us by way of a man named Joseph Thomas. Joseph Thomas is sometimes referred to as the White Pilgrim uh, because he was willing to go beyond the borders of his white culture to reach out because he was a follower of Stone and he was somebody who was impressed with Barton Stone and the movement's strong opposition to slavery. Now, remember, a lot of, uh, of this uh, is happening because of humanitarian efforts that are taking place in America in the wake of the Second Great Awakening. But the Stoneites group uh, abhorred slavery. And so we're going to talk about the tradition of Barton Stone and David Lipscomb uh, because that is one school and the other school is the Campbell School and these schools were in direct opposition at least early on. So Joseph Thomas in his, uh, his biography, his autobiography in 1812 shares his ob observations about the Christians at Cane Ridge which would have been Barton Stone's group. He says, the Christian companies, as he's reporting this, the Christian companies in this settlement and about Cane Ridge have been large. But within a few years, many of them who held back people as slaves, emancipated them and have moved to the state of Ohio. I will observe that the Christians of these parts abhor the idea of slavery. And some of them have almost thought that they who hold to slavery cannot be a Christian. The Stoneites were committed to social justice. It was woven into the fabric of who they were. They believed that those who shared the values of the world might hold slaves, pursue wealth and power, seek their own self-interests at other people's expense. They might participate in politics. They would fight in wars. Remember that the, the Stone Lipscomb tradition is one that was uh, strongly against uh, participation in civil government and strong pacifism. But those who took Jesus' values seriously, and this is what the Stoneites, uh, just calling themselves Christians, were trying to do, they thought that those who took Jesus' values seriously would uh, refuse to vote or fight, they would free their slaves, and would turn their backs on wealth and power uh, and selfish advantage over other human beings. This would help them to be fully devoted to the kingdom of God. So the Stoneites, uh, it, it was in their DNA at the very beginning to be against slavery and for social justice. Being committed to uh, not holding slaves um, that the attitude that Joseph Thomas observes that some have this attitude that if you held slaves you couldn't be a Christian. For many Stoneites, the attitude toward race was a test of Christian fellowship. Um, this this is the predominant view uh, 
especially in the, the old Stonite homeland of Middle Tennessee. For many, many years, by the late 19th century, uh, it began to get compromised, but the, it's the compromise that sort of brings about David Lipscomb's uh, participation in not, uh, in being bothered by the, uh, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the the evaporating compromise that it had not been present in the early Stonites' belief of slavery. So by the end of the century, uh, congregations are being separated by color, and David Lipscomb uh, simply could not understand this and fought against it. Uh, Lipscomb inherited many of the same worldview, the apocalyptic worldview of Barton Stone, uh, and made that perspective, the core of what he believed and what he preached. But Lipscomb strongly resisted racial discrimination in the context of the church. He, in many ways, flew in the exact opposite direction, flew in the face of the dominant uh, religious perspective in his time. In 1878, Lipscomb learns about a church just down the road from us in McKinney, Texas, in which some members had resisted a black Christian who had uh, gone and wanted to be presented for membership in the congregation. Lipscomb, who is the editor of the Gospel Advocate, pins very strong words of protest, uh, maybe as strong as anything he ever said, uh, reflecting his convictions about racial prejudice within the church. And I wanted to share some of those with you tonight. Lipscomb says, We believe it's sinful to have two congregations in the same community for persons of separate and distinct races now. Now let me time out there for a second. This is 1878. This is still present today. What are we doing? How are we working to achieve unity in the body of Christ? No doubt we need to work harder. But listen, Lipscomb's words are strong. Lipscomb says, God saves the Negro equally with the white man when he believes in Christ and puts him on by being buried with him in baptism. I had as soon think of the worst blasphemer in the land steeped in the vilest of crimes being saved as a man or woman who would stand between that individual and his obedience to God. He sits at defiance of God's law, assumes to be greater than God, and is guilty of a presumptuous sin in God's sight for which we can hardly believe pardon can be found. Strong words from David Lipscomb. God saves the believing Negro or white through his obedience, and one can one claiming to be a child of God say no? How dare any man assume such power and authority? How dare a church tolerate the persistent exhibition of such a spirit? Such a church certainly forfeits its claims to be a church of God. Whoa. We mean simply this. A church which cannot bring an individual to see his rebellion against God in such a course ought to withdraw from that individual as one who with a heart full of pride, bitterness, and treason fights against God. For our part, we would much rather mem prefer membership with, uh, sorry, prefer membership with an humble and despised band of ignorant Negroes than with a congregation of the most aristocratic and refined whites in the land who cherish such a spirit of defiance of God and his law and all the principles of his holy religion. Lipscomb gives us a couple of really significant insights. Lipscomb believes or, or, or expresses serious doubts about whether or not a racist can be saved. If you had to think about that question right now, how would you answer? Honestly, how would you answer? Second, Lipscomb calls for congregations to excommunicate those who seek to refuse membership to Christians of other races. And third, he, without any ambiguity, argues that a church which failed to take this step could not claim to be a church of Christ. And I'm not just talking about the name on the sign, could not be a church that followed Jesus. 
Wow. He did not view issues of justice and equality in the context of the church to be in agreement with the gospel. This is the same thing that Barton Stone had said as early as 70 years previous. It's no wonder then that attitudes toward race were for Lipscomb as they had been for Stone and others a test of fellowship. Racism in the church reflected the values of the world and not the value of the kingdom of God. There's another church in Nashville in 1907 where Lipscomb had another opportunity to deal with this issue. Uh, a young lady um, wanted to be identified, a young African-American lady, girl, uh, who had been adopted by uh, Mr. and Mrs. E.A. Elam, who were close friends of, of David Lipscomb and wanted to be a part of what was at that time the Bellwood Church. And Elam learns from this girl who was like a daughter to them. He learns that many in this congregation were quote unquote sore over her attending this what had been an all white congregation and told Mr. Elam that someone had told her, suggested to her that maybe she should go to the black church. Elam and Lipscomb were furious. And they said to send you to a church that is all black is fundamentally anti-Christian. Elam, a spiritual father in the faith to this girl, says, I have no patience whatsoever with this corrupt and abominable heresy that people believe that Negroes have no souls. Every other person in this church at Bellwood should be disturbed because of this. The whole church is disturbed over it. They're all heretics, sinners, and they should have all been kicked out of the church years ago. Lipscomb responds, No one as a Christian has the right to say to another, Thou shalt not, because he is of a different family, race, social, or political station. Jesus Christ personates himself in the least and in the most despised of his disciples. And as we treat them, we treat him. To object any child of God participating in the services on account of his race, social or civil state, his color or race, is to object to Jesus Christ and cast him from our association. And it is a fearful thing to do. Amen, David. Amen. So, how did we get where we are today? I mean, it can't, if you read these perspectives of Lipscomb and others and Stone, it sounds like, well, they sound to be very non-racist and open and embracing uh, and rooting those values and ideas in the gospel. What happened? Well, Alexander Campbell's perspectives are quite Perspectives are quite the opposite of Barton W. Stone. It's a totally different ethic uh, and approach. Campbell was all about the unity of all Christians, and, and that comes from his reading of Scripture. And so for Campbell, he relegated to the category of opinion, that is to say, secondary importance. He put everything in the category of secondary importance, all issues of social justice, where positions might be inferred from broad biblical principle, but where there wasn't just an absolute clear and discernible instruction. Even though these issues were important, Campbell maintained that they simply didn't stand at the core of the gospel, and hence they weren't suitable issues for debate in the broader Christian community. He rejected slavery for a number of reasons, and yes, he emancipated his own slave, uh, but he rooted his opposition to slavery in his judgment that in this age and in this country, it is not expedient. In 1845, um, and prior to 1845, Campbell refused to argue that slavery was sinful for the simple reason that the Bible never came out and said slavery is a sin. In 1845, Campbell says there's not one verse in the Bible inhibiting it, but many regulating it. 
Is it not then, we conclude, immoral? In certain cases and in certain conditions, slavery might be morally right. Campbell would not, quote unquote, unchristianize or non fellowship any, quote, Christian master, that is, someone who owns slaves. And he argued that no Christian community can make the relation of master and slave something that is a test of fellowship. <laughs> That's quite different from what Stone and Lipscomb thought. Walter Scott, uh, a Campbell follower, distilled it down to one sentence. He says, slavery is radically political and not a religious evil. Well, okay. Campbell, in, in continuing to flesh out, you know, what it is in Campbell's beliefs that, that, that makes uh, him have these thoughts and, and verbalize these things, Campbellized, in a sense, privatized Christian faith by making individual conversion most important, focusing on individual obedience to uh, first principles. In some sense, if you think about it, when you read uh, the New Testament when it comes to communion, communion is never meant to be something that is an individualized, privatized event. It is a communal experience, whether that's with Jesus and the disciples or whether that's the early church that you read about in Acts 2 and 3 and 4 and 6 and in Corinth even though, even though Corinth was jacked up beyond belief, they were still in a communal context. The individual privatization is something that stems from Campbell's view about conversion and first principles, meaning faith, repentance, confession, and immersion. Now, let's talk a little bit about another thing with regard to Campbell. Campbell placed a very heavy emphasis on the portion of the New Testament that started with Acts chapter 2. <coughs> he effectively downplayed you know, the biblical materials that spoke most directly to social justice. The Old Testament prophets, the Gospels, all which have pointed teaching from Jesus about compassion and about social concern. It did not take long for um, Stonite congregations to absorb the beliefs that Campbell and Scott and others um, imposed on them, that churches ought not to be disputing about slavery because it's not fundamental to the way the gospel uh, has been preached as Campbell preached it especially. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was one uh, ardent abolitionist, his name was John Seacrest, he went to Kentucky in 1828 solely to raise the issue of slavery. And this is, you know, only, this is less than 30 years after Cane Ridge, and he was rebuffed with extreme prejudice and, so, and, and told, do not broach that subject among us. We are living in peace and harmony, and we don't want our peace to be interrupted. We would love to hear you preach the simple gospel you've been preaching in Ohio, but we trust that if you have intended to introduce the question of slavery, that you will abandon those plans. Well strong feelings. No one articulated the feelings of Campbell clearer perhaps than Benjamin Franklin. Not the Benjamin Franklin who was a founding father, but Benjamin Franklin who was the epitome of the Campbell response to slavery wrote these things in 1859. If those who labor on the subject will show where the Lord ever gave a decision or opinion, we will publish and maintain it. This goes all the way back to the hermeneutic about the silence of Scripture. It's what's going to unfold itself in the 30s, 40s, and 50s as command, example, necessary inference, right? The same, Franklin says, goes for the apostles. If they will show where the Lord or the apostles ever discussed the subject, we will discuss it. If they didn't discuss it, we won't. Those who condemn us for ignoring it condemn Jesus and the apostles. Now, is that not the epitome of spiritual arrogance? It really is. Now, all of this leads to a collapse of what had been previously called uh, this ethical vision of Stone and Lipscomb. 
Well, you might be saying, well, DJ, why do you have a picture of Campbell and Lipscomb on the same screen? They didn't even live at the same time. They, they, who, who knows? And that's true. Lipscomb, while he could condemn racism in the church in no uncertain terms and could even argue that churches which tolerated racial discrimination were not even churches were at all, Lipscomb did not speak out on slavery in the larger culture. A lot of this is because Lipscomb had absorbed what he inherited from Stone, that apocalyptic outlook, with what Campbell had offered, which was a more legal, a more technical perspective of Scripture. And so he subscribed to it. He subscribed to the premise that slavery was political, not even a religious question to be considered. He, he said, slavery is a political relation established by political governments. Christ did not propose to break up such relations by violence. He recognized the relationship, regulated it, and put in operation principles that in their workings would so mold public sentiment as to break down all evil relations and sinful institutions. Now, you can't read that without also remembering Lipscomb's position about government and about politics. He didn't want anything to do with it. So in some sense, that, that is going to inform uh, his absorbing Campbell's position on this. Still, there is a prevalent view that believers thought, well, we can belong to the kingdom of God and we can stand separate and apart from the values of the world. But in reality, the values of the world were beginning to inform them and, and impose uh, its will on these believers before they even knew it. They fell captive to their culture uh, at the exact moment when they believed they had escaped its culture altogether. And so this sets the table for churches of Christ and the social gospel. Many churches of Christ, especially those who were standing in the tradition of Campbell, the more legalistic and radicalized people who defined the gospel in terms of the law and the pattern when it comes to the organization and the worship of the church, these are folks who just flat out viewed the social gospel as a non-entity. It's irrelevant. And, and the issues are not even, even fundamental to having faith. And so you ask yourself the question, you know, what's next? Well, what we're going to see are there a number of rea radical reactions against the social gospel. And these were pronounced by those labeled as uh, what Richard Hughes describes as people who were perceived as theological liberals. Now let me pause for a moment and talk about that term because conservative and progressive and liberal and conservative, those the usage of those terms crawls all over me because we use them and we misuse them. That, that, that's a better way of putting it. I'll, I'll give you an example. You attend a church, and you decide, well, I don't like the carpet color here. Well, there's a large group of people who do like the carpet. So you just keep your liberal opinions to yourself. Oh, okay, well, you might think, well, ha, 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 that's pretty funny. Let me give you a, a hypothetical situation. Let's say a church is built on the corner of uh, Buffalo Street and Bledsoe, and let's say it's around 1948. And that church decides, let's have a bell tower and have a bell that can call people to worship. Uh, excuse me? We don't need such technological innovation. And not only that, we're churches of Christ. We don't need a bell. Must be a liberal coming up with that idea. That's not liberalism. Having the perspective that someone believes differently than you and then castigating them with a label as a liberal, stop it. Don't be like that. That's not right. Being a theological liberal is something that is completely different. 
if you come to me and say, you know, based on my reading of Scripture, I think that Jesus didn't have a bodily resurrection. Now, hold on just a second. Let's go look at Scripture and let's talk through that because that is something that in the theological realm would be considered theological liberalism. Or someone saying, you know, Jesus, from the way I read Scripture, Jesus was married. Hold on a second, Hondo. That's not the way I read Scripture. There's a big difference in calling someone a liberal just because they don't believe like you and someone believing something that's grounded in their reading of Scripture that's just absolutely not there. There's a big difference in throwing around those terms like they're just nothing. Liberal, progressive, conservative. Don't, don't do that. That's not helpful. That's not healthy. That's not scriptural. What is healthy is sitting down across God's Word and, and talking through it and not looking for ways to denounce other people who have faith in Jesus just because you don't believe like they do. Okay, rant over. So let's talk about churches of Christ and the social gospel. Radical reactions against the social gospel uh, because people believed, you know, well, this is just theological liberalism. Well, not really. Let's start with the firm foundation. I'm just going to read this because I like the way... um, uh, Richard Hughes says this, Austin McGarry, the crusty old editor of the Firm Foundation, wrote a series of articles in which he asked what Jesus would not do if he were here on earth. With very little interest in the social gospel, having just read Charles Sheldon's book, In His Steps, he completely turned Sheldon's attention of the social gospel upside down, even to the point of bringing in Issues that were in the early part of the 20th century only issues in some circles of churches of Christ. Instrumental music or things like that. And he would even use the prophets to proof text what he was saying. That's McGarry and the Firm Foundation. That's one example of people targeting others who are trying to present Jesus' teachings on compassion and things like that that you find in the Sermon on the Mount and how those were in uh, in con- they were congruent with the teachings of the prophets and things like that. Well, in B. Hardiman, for example, 1923, he uh, was doing his famous tabernacle meetings at the Ryman Auditorium uh, or whatever the other, the other building was in downtown Nashville where he had those meetings, and he was uh, outspoken in, in criticizing those who called themselves Christians and emphasized social relief. He says that you've made social relief your God. You're not making Jesus the center of your church at all. He argued that in biblical times, people subsisted, quote unquote, in dirt and filth and thickly settled districts living in unsanitary conditions. Yet neither Paul nor any of the apostles were ever engaged in primary work of that sort. He concluded that the function and work of the church of God is not primarily for the furnishing of temporal help or assistance, But the paramount work of the church is to spread the gospel. Okay. Well, let's talk about the ACC lectures. Bill Bonosky wrote a book called The Mirror of Movement where he studied uh, the lectures at Abilene Christian for 60 years and synthesized trends in their teaching and in the subject matter uh, and their influence on uh, what would be preached and, and be considered you know, normal to hear in, in a church of Christ if you were to attend it during the same time as these lectures were going on. And, and as he talked about it, and here's what he said, he says, the very weight of the lectureship lodged the standard conservative objection to the social gospel that the social, and these are his quoting from different synthesized materials from these, these lectures, that the socially conscious liberals had forsaken the one great purpose of the church, namely the salvation of individual souls. The speakers made virtually no reference to such questions as labor management relation, capitalistic control, mass unemployment, bread lines, slum clearance, political reform, racial discrimination, or education for the handicapped and underprivileged. 
he goes on to talk about when speakers did express interest in things like supporting orphans and widows and the destitute. By the way, go back and read Isaiah 1. Go back and read Amos chapter 5. Go back and read Micah chapter 6. They almost invariably talked about those activities as a means not to fulfilling the work of the church and the work of Jesus, but rather fulfilling the means of individual conversion, that is to say, as works to help one accomplish the work of salvation. Very common perspective. Give you another uh, example. Uh, very little has changed by the time we get to 1960. There were churches. We talked about last week the Central Church of Christ that uh, had a massive program uh, to the point of housing 100 boys and 100 girls to keep them off the street and provide them with biblical education and with food and with clothes and housing. The church in Madison, Tennessee had an active uh, social ministry to orphans and widows and homeless uh, throughout the latter part of the 20th century. But these were the exceptions. These were few and far between. Uh, 1963, I mean, right around the area we're talking about, the Brookline Church Brookline, Massachusetts, established an interracial urban ministry that was called the House of the Carpenter. Graduate students from Harvard, voices that are going to become really important voices for Churches of Christ in the 70s and later in the 60s, by the way. Graduate students from Harvard and Boston University and MIT who were members at the Brookline Church uh, sponsored an after-school tutoring program. It had Bible classes for neighborhood youth. It had day camps in the summer, special classes for neighborhood residents, training them in fields from sports uh, to cooking to carpentry. This was one of the earliest forays uh, into inner city ministry among churches of Christ, and it thrived. It, it had a tremendous, tremendous impact in the inner city. Well, in 1967, a group called the Boston Renewal Authority uh, tore down the old storefront church that had been home to the house of the carpenter to make room for a new high rise. The Brookline Church was not, uh, not about to let this stop them, and so they purchased a new property that had classrooms and a library and recreation facilities and offices for staff and teachers. But... The whole thing came sh crashing down because uh, of an event called the Grove Hall Riot uh, in June of 1967. Well, when we think about this, it, it connects us to one of the main ways in which people in Churches of Christ criticized those who were finding ways to speak out against racism and social injustice. And that, of course, is going back to journals. Rule Lemons, who was the editor of the Firm Foundation, uh, upon hearing that the House of Carpenter had collapsed, he wrote, We can hardly stifle a yawn when some of our young radicals begin to push for the social gospel through projects such as House of the Carpenter. Incidentally, we understand that the House of the Carpenter has been given up as an experiment that failed and has been closed down. No, that's not what happened. It was destroyed in a riot because of its place of where it was in downtown. He says, we have no desire to say we told you so. Well, you just did, Mr. Passive Aggressive. We have no desire to say we told you so, but... We pick up things the denominations and the Salvation Army and others have tried for years without results. We can just expect them to fail. Lemons represented many in churches of Christ that quote unquote smelled liberalism in the church. Among those, he said, were less concerned with soul saving than with helping downtrodden people. Now just think about that. The two are mutually exclusive. You can't be concerned about someone's soul if you're worried about helping the downtrodden. Does that compute? Maybe it's just me, but that doesn't make any sense. Maybe not, I don't know. I know I'm a different generation. He hammered on this theme over and over and over and over again in 1969. 
Entirely too much of today's radicalism is aimed in one direction only, toward the social gospel. The things many young Christians are pulling for make good social fodder, but are poor Bible followers. Yeah, I just can't find anything in the Bible that talks about helping people. Do you find a disconnect with that? Jeff, am I crazy? Maybe I am. I don't know. Six years later, uh, a new and prevalent voice rising in the firm foundation, Buster Dobbs, makes a statement about this. He says, the gospel of Jesus, and this is reminiscent of Campbell. The gospel of Jesus places the, places the emphasis on the individual. The social gospel puts emphasis on the community. Jesus teaches soul salvation. Social gospel proclaims community salvation. I don't know that I agree with that. The gospel of Jesus encouraged an emphasis on heaven and not on earth. I guess Dobbs had never read the Lord's Prayer. The social gospel employs all of its energy in worldly, not heavenly interest. Well, I, I'm probably wearing my emotions too much on my sleeve tonight, but, but as I read this, it just infuriates me because this is going to continually contribute to why people fled our churches because they didn't see people worrying about other people. They were only worried about if they were right and if they were doing the right quote unquote works to accomplish salvation. We add to all these things about theology uh, the fact that for the most part, churches of Christ had lived and moved and had their being in the American South, right? We shouldn't be surprised to learn that in the 20s and in the 30s, racism had begun to uh, institutionalize itself in the church, just like it was doing within the modern culture. Many, perhaps, among churches of Christ, according to James Allen, who was the editor of the Gospel Advocate in the 1920s, he says, some preachers, elders, members were active members and leaders in the Ku Klux Klan. Segregation dominates the scene individuals and congregations in the 20th century. It wasn't just a, a matter of separating races by mutual consent. It was a matter of whites excluding blacks from their fellowship because they didn't view them as equal. G.C. Brewer, who we've talked about before, who, who was a, a voice that stood in opposition to Foy Wallace, who was going to make himself known again uh, later on, G.C. Brewer uh, in thinking back on his early life and ministry, says, none of us thought that inviting blacks into our homes as guests or sitting down to eat with them at the same table. We never thought about it. We felt that they should have the same food, but that they should eat in the kitchen or in the service quarters. These were the conditions that prevailed, and we faultly accepted it as right and satisfactory. Well, this institutional segregation it may uh, be exemplified in one story uh, and we're going to end with this um, tonight and and come back to Cassius next week but I want to talk about Marshall Keeble. Keeble had an unbelievable ability to move crowds period no matter who what the audience was he was Distinguished as probably the most successful of all the black preachers among churches of Christ in the 20th century. Converted hundreds and thousands. He was entirely dependent for financial support, largely on white churches for most of his ministry. Well, early in the 1940s, uh, Keeble had an exchange with Foy Wallace Jr. that sort of reflects the pattern of segregation that had become the accepted norm. Wallace initiated the exchange when he complained that certain black preachers were attending uh, or attracting large numbers of white church members to their meetings. Wallace most likely had Keeble right in his mind when he wrote in one of his journals, Bible Banner or Gospel Guardian, when he complained that if any of the white preachers should say everything that the black preachers say word for word, it would sound so common that the brethren would stop it. And I'm not going to read the rest because it's absolutely sickening. 
Wallace thought that there was such um, inequality that whites shouldn't even attend Keeble's meetings. And he thought that Keeble should impose the opposite view. Well, Keeble was the type of preacher who was able to communicate effectively across any race, across any line. But for some, that wasn't acceptable. And it caused a great deal of, of angst to the point where, you know, one Foy Wallace Jr. wrote that an acceptable black preacher is the one who knows his relationships in the church, knows what they are, because he knows his place with society. When I read that, I put a big red sad face in that particular text. It is sad. We have a lot of work to do to clean up the injustices that were caused and the beliefs about injustice that were preached in pulpits for generations. The good news is, in the same year, 1960, a man named Carl Spain is going to raise issues in a way that no one has raised issues before. And call Christians to act the way Jesus would have them act in regard to race. And so, I hope that you'll stay with us. Next week, we're going to continue this conversation and look at Carl Spain's world-changing 1960 speech and how it would affect Churches of Christ in the years to come. I want to thank you for, for being with us tonight. I want to remind you, if you're just now logging on, we're going to meet in person on Sunday here at the Church of Christ on Buffalo Street at 612 Buffalo in Gilmer, and I hope that you'll come be with us. Uh, we're going to gather together. We've been looking forward to getting back together, none more, more so than me. And I hope that you'll plan on being here. Join us on Facebook tomorrow at 10 a.m. for day two of our 40 days of prayer. You can get that calendar on our Facebook page. Uh, check in with us. Pray with us. Uh, tomorrow I think we're praying for our custodial and janitorial staff who uh, are being criticized more than ever for the work that's being expected of them at these schools and all the COVID talk. And so we're going to keep praying every day. Join us. Pray with us. Pray for us. Uh, and we're grateful that you were with us tonight to continue talking about these important pieces uh, of the history of Churches of Christ. God bless you. Have a great rest of your Wednesday night. We'll talk to you soon.